torn and the door flings wide I see glory as I run inside the throne room Before you, Lord, I bow Oh, the hell is torn Good evening, Jamaica. Good evening, world. Welcome to the throne room, the online prayer ministry of the Evangelistic Tabernacle here in South Florida. This is the evening edition. It's good to be with you once again. So let me ask, how was your day today? I trust you had a fabulous day today. Praise God. We had a wonderful time in our prayer and fasting service today. Yes, each Tuesday we meet from 12 noon for a prayer and fasting service on Zoom. You need to meet, meet with us if you haven't yet had the opportunity to do so. Praise God, Minister Barbara Johnson leads our prayer service. Tremendous woman of God. God blesses us with, with some very extra special times. But good evening. Good to be with you. Remember, this evening we have a special guest. Yes, Mrs. Lorian Joseph. She'll be sharing with us on grief. Yes, loss and grief. And um, how to cope with loss and grief. Yes. And um, we're coming to that a little later on. Okay. But let's get the, the worship going this evening. Let's invite C.C. Winans to come in the house. And she's going to be singing for us. Goodness of God. Yeah? Let us worship. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing a 
of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. God has been faithful all our lives. We give him the glory and the honor and the praise. Let's pause for a moment of consecration. Hallelujah. Praise God. When we come in his presence, we come in reverence. We come recognizing the awesomeness, the holiness, the otherness of God. 
we reflect on our own insufficiency, inconsistency, and we say, God, have mercy. Yes? And so we come this evening to ask the Lord to examine our hearts, to cleanse us, to wash us, to sanctify us. Father, we come in the precious, wonderful, holy, sweet, adorable name of Jesus. We ask, Lord, that thou would cleanse us from everything that is unlike you. We are aware that we sin in thoughts, in deeds, in speech, in attitudes. Lord, we have fallen short of the glory of God. We have come short. We ask your cleansing this evening, your washing this evening. Have mercy upon us, O God, according to thy loving kindness and tender mercies. Blot out our transgressions. We commit ourselves to you this evening. Bless our time together. Glorify yourself. Minister to our hearts. Hallelujah. Honor your name and your word in our midst this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Heal my heart, Lord. Make me new. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're delighted to be with you. We thank God for this awesome privilege that he affords us on a Tuesday to come right there in your living room, your bedroom, your motor vehicle, on your veranda. Yes, we are blessed with the privilege of just coming to keep your company, to minister unto you, to share with you. Yes, and to hear what the Lord has to say. Good evening. It's good to be with you. Yes, want to say hi, good evening, and welcome to those who are watching from their televisions and other devices. Good evening to you. We want to say special good evening. Yes, special good evening to all those who are on the church app. Yes, Geneva Dozar, Judith Brissett, Georgia Dewey. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. I want to say hi and good evening to those who are on our Facebook page, Jane Campbell, Kimberly Livermore, Lay Me. Hi, Miss Kim. Ah, uh, Vivian Lawrence, Verdika Wall. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Praise the name of Jesus. We come over to our YouTube channel and want to say good evening. Yes. Hilma Sharp is in the house. Danny Purpose, Thomas Paulette Scott, Beverly Prendergast, Jacqueline Perry Howard. Rona Parchment, Odith Miller, yes, Sylvia Bartholomew, Lynn Davis, 
Catherine Tucker, yeah, Molly Ho, Stephanie Francis, Mitzi Barrett, Georgia Dwyer, Joy Redway, Clarice Miller, good evening, Nicole McKnight, Anne Marie Duque, good evening, praise the name of Jesus, wonderful, praise God. Let's pause and let's just go right into our devotion. You know, on a Tuesday evening, our devotion comes to us from the word for today. I want to say special thanks and shout out to Sister Desireen White, the secretary there at Brownstone Tabernacle. And you know that she ensures that I have a copy, yeah, of the word for today. You know how I love this devotional, yes? Oh my goodness. If you're in Jamaica and you have not yet uh, purchased your copy, please go by the Brownstone Tabernacle and get yours, all right? Yes. So, the scripture reading comes to us from Proverbs 15, verse 31. The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. This evening's reading is entitled, Listen More Carefully. One expert points out that leaders touch your heart before they ask for your hand. That's the law of connection. Before a leader can touch a person's heart, he or she has to know what's in it. And you learn that by listening. A reluctance to listen is too, is too typical among poor leaders. Over half of all management problems are the consequence of faulty communications. And the vast majority of communication problems stem from poor listening. Many voices are clamoring for our attention. As you think about how to listen, keep in mind that you have two reasons for listening. One, to connect with people and two to learn about them that includes your competitors some mark which quipped if you don't agree with me it means you haven't been listening <laughs> though of course he was joking the sad truth is that when a leader views another organization only as competition, he or she focuses attention on building their own case, of championing their own objective, and forgets to learn from the other group's efforts. Now you don't necessarily want to base your actions on what the other person is doing, but you should still listen and learn how to improve yourself. It's a costly mistake to get so busy doing your own thing or trying to make things happen that you're not paying attention to what's going on around you. Every day you live and every experience you have, both negative and positive, can teach you valuable lessons. But you must listen. Wow. Listen more carefully. Powerful. Powerful. Wonderful. We thank God for this powerful devotional, yes? All right. We want to remind you of our church app, Evangelistic Tabernacle yeah, Church app. We want to remind you, if you have not yet downloaded it, yes, please do so. Go to the Google Play Store or the Apple Store and download our church app. It has so many features, one of which is that we it has a bible reading plan and that plan if followed each week each day we will read through the bible in one year if you have not yet begun the way it is structured you can you can listen to the scriptures while you're driving or riding traveling in the taxi or the bus put you can put your earphone in your ear and listen to the scriptures you can listen while you're washing or washing the dishes cleaning that whatever you're doing so listen get the app 
And again, yes, all the messages preached at Evangelistic Tabernacle, you can, at your own convenience, go back and listen to the word. And one of the reasons behind that is that the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. All right. So, and of course, the app will facilitate um, your giving to the Lord. And so we want to just segue now and go to go to the Kenya the Kenya feature our brother Howard Grant a member of the evangelistic tabernacle he's a missionary to Kenya yes and he's doing great work there in Kenya um, I'm going to ask my I'm going to ask my engineer, if you would just play the, the 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 interview, the interview with with brother. Howard, so if we have any person who is new, they will get some information about this project. Yes. Kingdom greetings, brothers and sisters. I have with me in studio, brother Howard Grant. He is the founder of Emmanuel Excel Tri-Unity Project, which is a non-profit organization whose current objective is to establish self-sufficient orphanages in Africa, beginning in Kenya. Brother Howard, welcome. Good to have you. Thank you, sir. It's a pleasure being with you. Wonderful. It's good to have you here to share with us about the vision, God's call on your life to serve in Kenya. You are currently serving as a missionary to Kenya. Now, what is the current vision? Um, well, basically, this vision is born out of my experience as a child growing up. And time won't permit me to get, get, get too much into that. But what, what our objectives are at the moment is to rescue homeless orphans and underprivileged children and to give them a place to live, to have them properly fed, and to educate them that they will grow up and live meaningful lives rather than just being dragged up through suffering all their lives. Mm. And we want to bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. Praise God. So that is a very important aspect. Yes, of what indeed, doing. indeed, indeed. Yes. How do you intend to fund this project? Well, we intend to fund it by establishing farms, okay. viable farms, okay. on which we will establish the orphanages. And so we're thinking about things such as pigs, chicken, fish, goat and cow. Um, so we will do them one by one and have them established. And then when they become viable and can generate, set up an engine, yes, they can generate capital for not just to feed the children, right, but also to bring, cause, uh, help us to expand the operation. Right, right. Wonderful. What are the immediate needs? Immediate needs um, involve, right now I have maize in the ground and it, we are coming to the end of the rainy season. We need water desperately. Mm. You will see on the screen people scooping up water off the ground to take home for their household chores. Mm. That is the situation with water there. There's a lot of water beneath them, but they just can't get their hand on it. Mm -hmm. Africa have the largest fresh body, second the largest second largest body of fresh water in the world. Wow. But so many people can't get water. So um, getting water is important. And um, uh, establishing a new chicken house. Um, so to get the water, you're gonna need a pump? I need a pump, yes. That's, okay. what, I, that's what I'm trying mm -hmm. to, I, I forgot. Right. Where I was going. But, so we need a pump. And because the pump costs about, about, about $300. Right. 
300 I, US. US. <laughs> right. I already have a well that I yes. dug. It's yes. not finished, but we have at least three feet of water in it. And so we can get water and to protect the crops that are now at the edge of the rainy season. Okay. Okay. And the second thing you need, because we're talking about the immediate needs. So pump right. first. Pump. To assist with the water crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, to ship a container that I have with clothing and other things for the, for the people in the area. And uh, that container is 3,000 something. About um, 3,600 dollars. I'd, 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 I'd run it off at 4,000. 4,000. These little miscellaneous things come up when you're in the, in the process. I also need to fund my flight back. <laughs> yes. Um, and that run about $1,200. It may be up or down depending on the season and how early the ticket is bought. And to currently maintain the people who are there. Yes. I pay them a salary every month, $100 for at least four of them. Mm. And um, I provide them with food and I pay the rent. Mm. All right. So, so we're looking at at three hundred dollars for the pump, four thousand to ship the container, mm. um, twelve hundred dollars airfare, mm. and then we want to establish a chicken coop. That will be about fifteen hundred. I was thinking about that, about fifteen hundred, and to, to establish a coop and um, to put our first hundred chicken in there, it will be about one hundred and thirty dollars. So fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred and thirty dollars, roughly. Okay, so 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 we're looking we're looking at five five five, and we're looking at. So we're giving you that um, synopsis into the project. We, we 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 we've paused that video because we have brother. Brother Howard live, yes, in living color. We have some videos, some sh very short videos. We want to show you of the progress being made. Um, uh, we, we the chicken coop and the, the chickens that are available, and he, he's going to talk talk us through the the videos as they roll. All right. So, Brother Howard, good evening. How are you? Straight to him. Yes, Brother Howard, I trust you're able to hear me. Hello? Yes, Brother Howard. Are you hearing yes. me? Uh, yeah, you were kind of in and out a while ago, and I yes. couldn't hear you very well, but I'm just now hearing. Okay. So what we're going to do, we are going to roll the, the videos <laughs> and then ask you if you would be kind enough to... To, to, to just guide us yes through what we're looking at so my engineer will begin to roll those videos yes Amen. I don't know if that is a stove. <laughs> All right, so we'll go to another one. Yes, bro, Howard. So here we are looking at... Uh... Okay, now that's what you're looking at is the... Is a is a toilet uh, pit that is being made. It's it's made just like the well. Yes. And there's two pictures of it. There's one where they dug it where it was still nothing was in it, and that one now the stone is packed around it. Mm -hmm. That is by the chicken house because by the chicken house we're going to have to have a place where we stay. So initially, we're going to finish a piece of the chicken house, not just like two two decent rooms. Until we're able to build something else, then we give the chicken all of it. <laughs> but at this point, we are um, um, preparing uh, for toilets. Um, 
that's what the pits are for, or that well-looking structure. And uh, these are some chickens that I bought a week ago. Um, and they are, they're not in the official chicken house yet. They are at the place where my folks are staying. Um, they, the owners that rent the land had, have a little chicken house there. But it, it won't be enough for them when they, they get bigger. So um, those will be removed and put to the other spot. The chicken house we're building can take over a thousand chickens. So we have improved the capacity yet. But we're, we're working on it. And that is the chicken house you're looking at. Um, the, 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 the further end away from us is complete. In other words, the whole structure is not ready yet, but we're, there's a part of it that is finished that we're going to put some chickens. We're going to start there while we work on the rest of it. Because time is going and time is money. So rather than waiting for the whole thing to be finished, we could end up losing several months within which chicken could have been bought and sold by that time, um, particularly broilers. So we're trying to be as efficient as possible with, with what we have. Okay, that, that hole is the pit that was dug, and then they start putting the stones in. And after those stones go in, they'll continue to dig, eh? Because they dig under the stones, and then the stones keep dropping. The whole circle keep dropping until they get to the desired depth. Yes. Were you, are you able to hear me, Pastor? We're hearing you clearly. Oh, yes, yes. So, um, basically, we're moving with what we have. Um, it's a challenge. Um, those little chickens eat like, uh, you'd be surprised to know what they can put away in a short time mm. because of the sheer number of them. And um, But we're progressing a little at a time, thank God. And... Uh, that is where we reach. Um, still, still not finished with the chicken in our know, so that, that picture that you see, there was still a little part of it that was not covered. Yes. And um, I don't know if I don't remember seeing the other picture. There's another picture where you see the interior yes. of it with with stuff strewn all over. So now they need to clear that out and cover it with sawdust. Uh, yes, that's the one. Um, that's it. That's the far end of the structure you were looking at from outside. Right. In there, it's ready. And so it's just a matter of removing all of those objects and um, spreading out the sawdust. I didn't concrete the bottom because it was, we'll have to do that later. Hmm. Um, but we're going to just put the, the sawdust sticking out and move uh, the chicken there. Until until we can do better. Wow, wow! So we have chickens already on their way. We have. Please tell us about the broilers. Yes, we, we yes. Uh, there was a lady that had sent a hundred dollars for us through you, and we um, we we pay, we we ordered a hundred chickens. It turned out to be a hundred and forty. A hundred and well, it's only just forty dollars, roughly, in our money, but it's it's um, I think about a thousand, ten thousand something there. Yes. Um, so we order some some layers, and I think the the vast majority of what we're going to get is layers because the layers will produce um in the long run better than broilers in the long run. For the short term, broilers are quick. But the layers will produce a lot more than um, the price of a chicken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. So, you know, um, we, we'll we'll talk some more next week about the project. Um, we have a special guest in studio um, on our Zoom platform, so we want to make way for our guest, but let's let's ask this evening those who have a desire to assist with the work there in kenya 
we are preparing ourselves to to create orphanages that will be able to minister to to children there in Kenya and so you have the the, the opportunity to give um, to assist with the work you know we have to feed the chi the chickens remember it's a self sustainable project we're developing and so we have we have started and we want to get it off the ground solidly so we're asking for assistance as we buy you know the feed to feed these precious chickens and soon we won't have to ask for assistance on a frequent basis because we'll have a turnover. So the information is on the screen and as the Lord leads, we ask you to follow and give what he encourages you to give. Praise God. Wonderful. Thank you, Bala Howard. Bless you. Safe drive. God bless you, Pastor. God right. bless you. And All thank you. Sure, you're most welcome. All right, my brothers and sisters, this evening we have our special, we have our special guest uh, presenter with us here in the in the throne room. We're going to be looking at coping with grief and loss. Yes, we have with us Sister Lorian Joseph, Mrs. Lorian Joseph. Mrs. Lorian Joseph, MA Honors, GCC Lorian, has been a professional counselor for the past 30 years. She holds a Master of Arts in Counseling Honors from the Caribbean Nazarene College, Santa Cruz, Trinidad and Tobago. Lorian is also a certified telehealth mental health professional since July 2017. Lorian has been a certified grief counselor with the American Institute of Healthcare Professionals. Her 30 years of professional counseling experience includes working with a wide variety of clients in a range of specialized areas, including career, premarital, marital, family, grief, and crisis counseling. Lorian provides supervision to counseling and social work interns in related therapeutic and client care activities. On behalf of local colleges and universities, in keeping with her passion to share her expertise and knowledge with others, she has facilitated several training work workshops in grief counseling. She is the founder and host of Hugs for You, a monthly online support group for grievers 18 years and older. Lorian has been happily married, yes, for 31 years and is the proud mother of a teenage son. She's currently a team member of Acropolis, New Creations Caribbean Limited in San Fernando, Trinidad. She also provides psychological support to members of her local church and wider community. Sister Lorian, good to see you this evening. How are you? Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, we're not getting your sound Did yet. You hear me? Oh, we're oh. hearing you now. Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. She's Hi. looking so beautiful, so gorgeous. Good to have you Thank in the throne you. room with us. Yes. And, um, I'm honored. Wow, <laughs> we're blessed. We're blessed to have you. Um, Sister Lorian is going to be making a, a, a presentation, and um, she she sent us her her PowerPoint. So we are going to 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 organize to to have it up. Okay. All right. So we are going to. Okay, so Brother Matthew already has it and he's going to be throwing it up and he's going to be assisting her as she shares with us. After she has shared, you'll be able to, you'll be free to type your questions in the chat or you'll be able to call us and um, 
on our line that our engineer will share the number four later on. So, Sister Lorian, over to you. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Bless and you. it's a pleasure to be here. And I am delighted to share on behalf of my husband and son all the happy things that we want to say hello to members of your church and some special family members as well. And those of you who are joining from Jamaica and the rest of the world, thank you for being here with us today. So I'm going to get straight at the coping with grief and loss and I'm tightening it, the hangover and how to grow with grief. I chose the idea of hangover because that's what we, grief is something we experience every day and we sometimes wish it would go away. Um, at the start of a new year, sometimes we think, oh my God, why am I going over into the new year with grief? But the truth is grief doesn't go away actually. It is gonna stay as long as we are alive. So I hope we are, we are gained and we are buckled and ready to go. So hangover is something that we experience every day. So there's a definition there in one of the slides telling us what hangover is. It's that sad, anxious, aching feeling the day or days after, after a special occasion when we wish our loved one was near or close to us. And it's that continuous feeling of pain and sadness we feel year after year or day after day for that matter um, as we cope with it so the other slide gives us an idea of what grief looks like in itself um, grief is that unique personal experience that we have each person has um, it's interesting that each of us wish we would have done things differently or when somebody is grieving, we say, oh, I would have done something differently. But according to Megan Divine, she says, you know what? If you want to know what it is, I would prefer you do not know. And I hope you don't get a chance to find out. So those of us or those persons who have not yet experienced grief in any form, I hope the journey to that point will be a long time away. I hope so. So let's talk a little bit about how to cope with grief. I'm suggesting that we use the task model, which is proposed by William Warden. And I will explain why I prefer this model as compared to other ones we may have heard about or ways we think we can cope with grief. I am trying to give a perspective. It is a perspective. It is not a prescription of how we should. So that's what I'm hoping to do tonight. It's a journey. So grief is a journey, it's a process, it's not an event. And um, the four main tasks we're gonna talk about would be, we'll talk about them in detail in a bit. Accept the reality of the loss, to process the pain of your loss or grief, adjust to life without your loved one, and to remember your loved one while moving forward. And those of us who may have been familiar with grief stories or narratives, um, Kluber Ross, the Swiss-American psychiatrist who first came up with some of what we perhaps would have heard about the stages of grief, anger, which focuses on emotions. So you'll hear emotions like anger, depression, guilt, and sadness. And then, of course, it is different from Freud, if you follow Freud, because his is different in that he was telling us that we need to break ties with the deceased. So this is different in, in that the task model is really focusing on things or tasks or duties or activities that a griever would normally participate in in order to help him or her to cope with grief. And the second idea is that we want to grow in, with our grief. So we are dealing with the hangover of it because it exists, it continues to exist while we are alive. And then how do we process it? So there's a slide that gives us a visual representation of what growing in grief looks like. Uh, most of us are perhaps familiar with the idea that we think that grief should... Um, that's the word I'm looking for. That grief should... It would shrink. That's what I was hoping to find. It will shrink. So as we grow, grief would shrink. And then there are other persons who are of the view that grief doesn't shrink. 
it doesn't get smaller, really. We grow around it. And those of us who will argue that I prefer grief not to shrink because in, in our book or in our view, grief is really the flip side of love. So if we decrease the love we felt or feel for our loved ones in a different way, not in a physical way now because they're living in our hearts, our minds, our memories, uh, we prefer it not to shrink. So if you hold a particular view that grief should shrink, then we're going to have a challenge in coping because you're going to say, oh, my God, this event or the feelings or the anxiety and the sadness that I keep feeling every day that creates this hangover, then I am not grieving well or I'm not grieving properly and grief is still so present with me and I'm not coping well. So that's if you have that perspective. If you think you grew around grief then, then you will have a different view. And I am of the view and I prefer the view that we grew around our grief because we are human beings and all living things grew. I remember in high school, um, there was this mnemonic that we used to remember um, the characteristics, characteristics of living things, Grimna. And it says, all living things breathe. breathe. So if we're human beings and we're here today, we are always going to be grieving once we're alive. So only living things grow and only living things will grief so we are going to grow around our grief so how do we grow around our grief it, it sometimes we think that growing around our grief is not something we want to do um, but if we are living human beings we are going to have to deal with that perspective because it will remain painful for some time that that's the reality i'm not going to pretend it isn't um, but we learn new experiences. We learn how to grow. We learn how to cry. We le learn how to deal with our emotions. In those experiences, we also meet other people who process grief. And then we have what we call shared grief events and experiences. And I hope nobody stones me, but in the midst of grief, there are other opportunities for enjoyment. I am very sure there are other persons who propose that Grief is really a dual process. We sometimes experience happiness and on the flip side, we could experience sadness. So it's that we could move from one um, moment of sadness to another moment of happiness. And in reality, we do have some of those experiences in our own lives. You know, we are celebrating um, the birth of someone and at the same time, the next two days or in the midst of all of that, we can be burying a loved one. So we, we learn as human beings how to go through those emotions and move from one space to the next. Then, of course, grief is a journey. It never ends. I, I mentioned that before. But it changes. It's really not a passage. It's a passage, not a place to stay. Grief is not a sign of weakness that some people think, oh, if we cry, um, something is wrong with us and we're not strong enough. But we don't need to be strong to be a griever. We just need to grieve the way we know how to. And I, the first slide or one of the, perhaps the second one, had a thumbprint. And each thumbprint reminds us that we are individual, different. Nobody's going to grieve like we are. We are unique human beings. So grief is not even a sign of weakness, nor is it a lack of faith. It is the price we pay for love. And I remember hearing that phrase, grief is a price we pay for love when the late Queen Elizabeth wrote to President Bush at the time during 9-11. And in her greeting was this line, grief is a price we pay for love. So when we miss our loved ones, we are really saying to them in our own existence that because they were important to us or valuable to us, we miss them and so we grieve. Now, I am not going to say to anyone the extent to which you grieve is the extent to which you love. That's for you to decide and evaluate for yourself. As I said, it's a perspective, not a prescription and not a judgment or evaluation of anybody's grief. And then sometimes we, we have this roadmap where we have in our head what grief should look, look like. Um, this was just one a quick, that um, graphic gives us a quick idea of what some people think it is. Now, on the left, or I'm using the left on my screen facing you, is a roadmap we expect. So that 
um, drawing was representative of tuberosis idea of sometimes we experience denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. But it is not as simple or not as straightforward as that. The one, the road that we got gives us a real um, visual representation of what grief sometimes and oftentimes look like. It is, this is a simple confusion, one confusing one, but it is a very confusing, um, like a maze, some people describe it. It's not a journey that is clear cut. We have very different um, views and experiences along the journey. So one way, in essence, I'm saying, if we know that this is what grief looks like, it helps us to cope. It helps us not to um, second guess ourselves or criticize or think we're grieving abnormally because we're doing something crazy that other people don't do. Of course, that's true. We're going to grieve differently. But we have an idea that it's not going to be something that's easy or straightforward. If you have an idea and you believe that is so, then that helps you now to say, okay, I think I'm doing okay with grief. If I cry and I cry tomorrow and I cry the day after, that's quite fine because there's no limitation on how often I should or what I should do. So we come to some factors that mediate between how we grieve. And um, it's important for us to remember those things. Um, I perhaps won't explain all of them, but I just mention a few or just head through them quickly and then I want to focus one on two ones. Um, character of the disease. So if this person was a loving sweetheart, now I'm almost going to use some Trinidadian expression, sweetheart, doodoo, punkans, or my darling, precious mom or dad or relative, then because of the character of the disease, this person was loving, kind, and person of integrity. So the response that you would have to someone who dies having that um, unblemished character, if that's what you want to say, or a response to that person will be different as compared to a bandit or a robber. And like, okay, he killing people. So if he die, it's okay, quote unquote. But of course, there are human beings who are going to miss the robber, who are going to miss the thief, who are going to grieve those persons as well. But I'm just saying generally, um, that's how we tend to say, okay, oh gosh, I miss this person. What am I going to do without this person? This person was my left hand, my right hand, my heartbeat. Depends on how you describe the person. And the, the relationship you have with the person. Now, it's good to have a relationship with the person. So the person could be your mom and your dad or your uncle or your cousin. But it doesn't, the relationship doesn't necessarily um reflect the kind of relationship you have with the person or the level of attachment. So you could all, all of us could have the same mother, same father, but the relationship or the attachment to that person is different for each person. And how the person died will also be a, a, a factor that influence or impacts how we grieve or how we cope with it. For example, suicidal death, there are persons who have, you know, in a society where we have stigma attached to that, that person's going to go to hell or the family did some awful things. So that's why that person is like that. So the remaining members who are grieving will sometimes have to deal with not just the death of that person, but they have to also deal with the shame and the guilt and the ostracizing experiences that they may get from the communities or society. And then how the person, what's your coping style? Um, did the person die leaving a will? Um, I think somebody's going ahead of me, so you could just go back a little bit. Sorry. Um, if you if you go back, one slide back, right? Nice. So if the person dies without a will, of course, if you're in any woman society where experience a family member or parent particularly a parent who dies without leaving a will the confusion so those nice loving families that we had before when this person dies sometimes as they will say all hell break loose or some awful experiences happen with families because that doesn't happen so imagine if there is a will and everybody is clear then we don't have to grieve about dispute with families. We could focus on grieving the fact that the person died and we miss him or her. Um, your religious beliefs about death, um, that will guide you as to say, okay, 
um, this person is a Christian, I know where he or she is going, that helps give us to just make the pain go away. But you grieve with a sense of hope that someday your heart is at rest. I don't have to worry about his salvation. So that helps you to cope and say, okay, I know I will meet him or her again some sweet day. And we know where that person is going. So our heart sometimes is at ease or should be at ease. And then the culture. This is this is what interesting part i'll probably just say two things about culture now of course i'm living in trinidad and it's a multicultural society and i have had to adjust to um many many things about death here but one of the interesting ones is someone could die today in trinidad and be buried today as well so imagine me coming from a jamaican culture where you take even a month or more before someone is buried i have to adjust to that in my mind myself and there are times i'm like speaking to family members that i'm hearing this person died and then i'm hearing the funeral some months later and i'm like i have to catch myself and not be um expressive of what i perhaps was thinking because i'm in a culture where within a week by a week the most two weeks that person is buried and it you really don't pass a week unless some unforeseen situation will cause that. So I've had to adjust to that in both times because I'm like, so how do you get time to grieve and be around family if the body is buried or cremated? And this is another change for me too. I grew up in a culture where all I know about was burial. But now I have to deal with cremation or burial. And uh, yes, so I'm, I'm, I'm processing that myself. And of course, there are many other persons who have different experiences of grief and how you cope with it. I remember some years ago, I had a client, I could share that because nobody will know who and so on. Um, this person came from a particular religious group uh, where women were not allowed to touch the body of the dead. And this client said to me, I spent all my last six months taking care of my mom and to realize now I can't and be close to her because of the religious views and of the culture and, and so on that they were not. So it was very difficult. So she had to process that and we went through that whole journey. And that's no longer an issue now, but it's something she remembers when she deals with her grief. And then we're talking about knowing your coping style. Hmm. This is an interesting one. Um, I don't think before I, I did studies in grief and focus on that, as a young child, I grew up, somebody died, you cry. And I didn't know if I was a special, you know, coping style or not, because we learned everything from the environment around us, from our parents and from our church family, in terms of how we dealt with grief. So. You have the intuitive griever who thinks rationally. So they're, sorry, not rationally. They think emotionally. So they are hard grievers. They talk more about their feelings. So these are persons who you could identify with Kluberos saying we have anger, depression, denial, and those kinds of feelings. The instrumental griever is the griever who would be thinking so these are persons who could actually plan the whole funeral, get all the things done, and you will wonder if they had feelings. But they do, but they're just different. And then you have those who are dissonant grievers. They say one thing, and then they behave differently. And I, when I think about that, I was thinking about people in church context. They will say, I'm blessed and highly favored. You know, and God is with me. But they say those things externally, but internally they are really, really stressed and depressed. But because we're in a society, we're in church, you have to, you know, give this sense of you believe in God and God will take care of you and stuff like that. But we don't deny that. But it is having that, that war between the cells in terms of what they think or believe, in terms of religion or Bible or whatever else may have been their worldview. And what their heart is saying. So you'll have that that conflict. And then you have those avoiders. And um, most, most people are the avoidant grievers. Where you isolate yourself. No, I'm not 
describing you, but if you fit in this category, if the um, stone fall in a the garden, then you know you take it as they will say. So these are persons who isolate themselves. Now, we're not judging persons when we describe them. We're just describing so when you could identify that. This is how I cope with grief. This is my style. So you're not going to get me screaming on the place. Now, of course, we don't know what will happen when a loved one dies. We really don't know. But most of us will say, okay, because of what I know about myself, I think this is what I will do. So the persons who are avoidant grievers, they isolate themselves from people. Now, it's not a right or wrong thing because grief, there is no right and wrong behavior. We will describe it as healthy or unhealthy. That's probably what I would say about that. And isolating yourself, if permanently, then I will suggest that you reconsider. And sometimes there are persons who work all the time, busy, 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 because they don't want to cry, they don't want to think. Um, they watch TV a lot and perhaps sleep or use alcohol. I'm not going to recommend it, but that's what happens. They cope with it. And if, if you're in, in around the, the grave side, you will see grave diggers. They consume a lot of alcohol because that's their way of coping with whatever is happening there. So they're just digging grave without feelings or emotion or trying to subdue those emotions. And sometimes we steer clear away from even good memories of the person because we don't want to be reminded of it. Um, not that they weren't special to us, but just the pain of having to process the, the death and the fact that we miss them. And then sometimes we find ourselves procrastinating. We no longer do things even though we know they're to be done. And then there is excessive worrying. So... Some of us may cope with grief like that. Um, one, the awareness helps us to know, okay, how we grieve and how we want to process it. And, and also people who know if this is how we grieve. So imagine you're in a family where you have majority, if you have 10 persons and nine or 10 or eight of the 10 are avoidant grievers or instrumental grievers or intuitive grievers or dissonant grievers. So that helps us to realize that, okay, if we're in a family, even though I'm grieving on my own or that's my, my way of dealing with it, imagine if we have those many persons in a family grieving the same way. Then we may end up with persons who agree and then persons who disagree or some tasks we perhaps not get done. And then we perhaps create conflict or misunderstanding and challenges with how to work things out. So bear that in mind when you think about coping, how the family, how your individual group grieving, sorry, will impact how other persons grieve as well within the family. And then we come to the task. So the first task is to accept the reality of the loss. So the person died, mommy or daddy or uncle or Mary Jane, and we give them a name. Now, the experts suggest that we grieve intellectually so we know in our head that the person dies we go through the emotion we know and then we talk about emotionally feeling and knowing that this person dies and um the the um funeral is one way of cementing or making real the fact that the person dies of course we have those challenges where people who have never returned from war or who disappeared and we have no idea what became of them. Imagine persons trying to grieve and come to terms with what we use the word closure. Um, but let me say there's no closure in grief, but just the idea that, okay, we have an awareness that, yes, this person died, we see a body, we know there's one, we went through, we participated in the um, funeral service or the wake or the memorial services or the rituals concerning it. So we know that the person died. So the next one, the next slide gives us a picture now of what the reality of that death looks like. So imagine in the first one, you will realize that there is the person who died, the main person who died, or you will say, put the name of that person in it. So if you have a grandmom who died, or if you have a husband who died, or a father who dies, then you realize that it's not just, we're not just grieving the fact that this person dies, but what did this person represent? Was this person, okay, let's say a father dies. So the father dies. 
So therefore, the wife has no partner. They probably he was the only breadwinner. So of course, things are going to change within the family because we do not have all those that particular person was holding many responsibilities and roles. So when you get up now, I remember an elderly lady said to me when her husband died, she said, girl, I never know how to drive. So now I have to adjust to life, learning how to drive, getting somebody to pick me up initially when she didn't know how to drive. So it was just things that you have to do. But yes, what we realized afterwards in that process, in that moment of doing some things, we learn and we gain skills that we probably would not have or we may have avoided our son in the past and said, nah, they will do it for me. But now we have to do it for ourselves. Now, I also know that the fact that a person dies, we sometimes um, have to deal with the fact of lost identity. I remember... Um, I've always often used this example. When when my son was in kindergarten and you go to the school to pick him up, nobody knew my name. You only used to hear, um, Lawrence's mommy, Lawrence's mommy, Lawrence's mommy. And I'm like, so imagine if you grew up for the rest of your life, say, I lost Lawrence. I'm no longer, quote unquote, Lawrence's mommy, even though I am in one sense, but because the relationship has changed, he no longer exists. People would hardly likely want to describe me as Lawrence's mommy because Lawrence no longer exists. And sometimes maybe the loss of a, a best friend, we may experience a loss of faith, a loss of intimacy. So we no longer have a intimate partner because our spouse has died and we perhaps may have lost a job. And you could imagine the extent. So, so while there is this primary person who died, there is there are the secondary losses we experience with this person who dies. So that's a coping challenge. So, in fact, you will hear young people will say, um, especially young boys after the father died, oh, you know, you're the man in the house. No, you know. Imagine a four-year-old or a six-year-old or a 10-year-old trying to be, quote-unquote, man of the house. Then he will be grieving um, a premature expression of trying to be man of the house and do not really know how to grieve as a child because he would have taken on big people responsibility, as you will see. The second one task is to process the pain. Now, this is a piece that most people shy away from or don't even know what to do. But it is important for us if we're going to grieve and cope with grief and loss is to acknowledge that we have lost someone, acknowledge that this is the pain we feel. One writer says the only cure for grief is to grieve. So, it's difficult to tell people how to cope when they try not to not to grieve. The only way, or the uh, that's my view too. The only way to grieve, to cure for grief, well, there's no cure. But the only way to grieve, and to grieve is to grieve. It may sound simple, but it is true. But of course, it is a challenging experience for people to you know experience the sadness and and. The fact that the person is no longer there and sometimes you yearn and you search and you walk through the house hoping to, to see this person come back. I remember just recently someone says, okay, I know my husband will come home. So at around nine o'clock or so, we say, okay, he would normally come home that time. So you're waiting up for him and then you realize that he isn't coming home because now 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock and that is going on for days. So it's important for you to, for us, if we're going to process grief in that way, is to experience the pain, to confront our feelings, to deal with the emotions. And sometimes we feel that awful hollowness in our stomach when our tightness in our chest or oversensitivity to noise, you know, those things that, that happens to us. And it's important for us to, to kind of note that's how the feeling is and the feeling is real. Oh, let me pause and catch my breath a little bit. <laughs> so we also know that grief is not on a schedule. It's not going to happen that way. Neither, neither is death. It's not on a schedule. The interesting thing is that we all know that it is appointed unto man wants to die, but somehow nobody wants to die. And But loss and grief is inevitable. 
Um, we cannot lose what we do not hold dear or value. So when we experience grief and pain, it's going to be a challenge for us. But we have to also prepare for death and to anticipate that it's going to happen sometime or the other. It's not a schedule we're going to know about, but it's one way to prepare for it. And if I were to take the position or take the role of the pastor to preach the gospel, then we all have to experience relationship with God so that when our number is called, when that time comes, we know that our election is sure. So that's important for us to remember. That's one way to cope with grief is to remember it's going not for just the present, not just to live on this earth, but to ensure that when that happens for us or anybody else who's close to us, it's because they've had their own personal encounter with God. It's important to also know if you're going to cope well with grief is that grief shows up in our bed. And BED really means it shows up in B for body, E for emotions, and D for disposition. I really couldn't help not saying show up in bed because I know my dad would have created some kind of funny ways to remember. At one point, I was going to put another D for double bed because I heard somebody um, when they spelled bed one time. Or was it bread? Yeah, bed. They had B E D D, and they said the reason for the two Ds because it was a double bed. But I, I, I'm not gonna go there. I'm just being funny right now. So, so grief shows up in our body, and and sometimes when we're grieving because we don't know these things are happening to us, um, we tend to forget how it shows up. So sometimes we get aches and pains. Don't just say, oh, it's just a pain in my body. Sometimes it really shows up the stress that we experience and the loss of our bereavement grief or the loss of a spouse is the number one item on an event for stress, evaluating stress, homes and re um, depression checklist. Grief for the loss of a spouse is number one. And bereavement or loss of a close family member is perhaps number six. So imagine if somebody goes through the pain of losing someone, then we realize how it manifests itself. Sometimes we have no, we feel nauseous, we have headaches, and we can't seem to know why. We have blurry vision and things like that. And so it, what what that says to us, because it shows up in our body, in our emotions, and the way we act, that we should do self-care go visit a doctor go check yourself so that you don't just say okay i just feeling tired or is gas it might be true but it is also important to go check on your body to ensure that what's happening to it um it could be as a result of grief and pain and then of course there are how no know the emotions as the next slide we will look at talks about the emotions that are that accompanies grief, and they are many. Um, it's important for us to be aware of them and to process them. There is one that I often like to talk about is anger. Um, it shows up a lot in or after. I mean, the other emotions do, but um, it's one of those leading causes for conflict in, in, in families where the anger is there. We're not really sure where it's coming from. Um, I didn't put choose this picture, but I know there is there's this um, anger iceberg. There, there's this picture of an anger iceberg. If you know what an iceberg is, it appears um, what we see on top is just a little view or a little bit about what the iceberg looks like. But underneath the water level is this big chunk of ice that was big enough to sink a titanic so imagine our grief the anger that we feel as a result of the pain or the loss it's important for us to process it and to remember that anger is only one letter away from danger so if you put d before anger you get danger so ensure that you process your anger and work through it and work through other feelings of sadness and irritability or feeling scared and some people may feel calm so don't think they're always just negative views associated with anger 
with with grief. There are also positive ones that we feel a sense of. Uh, I wouldn't say. Well, let me find a word I'm looking for before I. Of relief. Now, people get judged on that, and we're not here to judge people. But if you be honest with yourself, it's like. Oh, like a burden lift off their shoulders. So some people feel a sense of relief for different reasons and they will share that with us. And when they do, I say if that works for you, then that's what we work with the person. So a sense of relief that the person is not suffering anymore or no longer a burden to us and we get a sense of relief if that's what it is. And then there are persons who are hopeful that someday, one day, we'll meet grandma again or we'll meet grandpa again or whoever the person is that we have lost. And if we're going to cope with grief, then we need to express or look for support from others. Let other persons support us. So that's important for us to seek support. Um, one of the challenges people have with giving support is when people are grieving, we don't always know what they need. And um, people have the expectation that we're supposed to know that they need these things. And it's not fair to us who are non-grievers in that particular sphere to kind of know exactly what you would need. We sometimes have an idea that this may help and so we may choose to do that. But it's important for us or for persons who are grieving to let other persons know how they can support you. And I'm sure if they're able to, they will, rather than leaving, leaving it up to them or us to guess this is what will work for you. Um, of course, sometimes because we are considerate and caring, we try to think, you know, um, empathize and be in this case and think of what this person would need um, if I were in their position. But the truth is, you're not in their position. So it's difficult to know. And then another expression, this is my, my view of support, is it involves self-care. S for self-care, U for understanding, understanding the grieving process, understanding that there are other persons who grieve differently. And the P is for a plan. Now, I didn't talk about that before, but I will do so right now. That, you know, it's interesting that we have a plan for if we were to have a hurricane, what to do, an evacuation plan, if there is fire in your house, what to do. But somehow, even though we know death is in inevitable, and we are going to grieve. Some people don't really have a plan as to how that's going to happen. And we're not in a, in a society where plan, plan, but you don't plan for grieving. And how do you do that? Um, there are people who suggest that if we have a plan of how to do something, we cognitively prepare for it. And it helps us to create this sense of, I know what to do if this were to happen. So if there are some people who have no idea, what would we do? if this person dies what is the process what is involved in that so that's part of a plan to what do you do when this person passes away or what's the process what's the protocol what are the things you need to do having that then also what's the plan for sharing this information to families are we just going to leave it now we're in an era of social media and sometimes we hear things by before the family members know about it, you could go to a Facebook page or something and you find out about some things that you wish you didn't find about that way. I remember working with a client sometime and he says, no, I heard about my brother's death. He was murdered, not from a family member, not from the police, but from social media. And of course, you have all these memes and things that people add. And sometimes it can be intrusive and challenging for people to work through that. So it's important to have a way of processing that. Now, I don't remember us having a plan growing up as, as children, but um, how we grieve is partially based on our experience as a child, whether we lost a toy or a pencil, how did our parents and family members treat with us? The, the, the sense of care, did they say, oh, they empathize with us and say, okay, let me help you. I'm so sorry I've lost this. Or you said, come to you, we cry for that small thing. If that's the case, no, I didn't sound Jamaican there. I mean, I wasn't talking about any Jamaican, but yes. What you're crying for, I'll give you something to cry about. Maybe that's what your experience was. And so that will sometimes shape how we see the world now as adults. Because how we grieve now didn't just happen because we turned adults. It started in how we were brought up. 
and I had good experiences. I remember I was just thinking recently, we had dogs and one was blacky and one was brownie. And when they died, I remember my sisters and I, well, I didn't initiate the funeral service, but we did have funeral services for the dogs. So we learned very early to honor life and to, you know, ensure that the persons who feel sad and burdened by grief and loss are supported. And so that's important for us to know. And grief should, support should be ongoing. You know, sometimes after the funeral happens and everybody gone back home, who gone to foreign, who gone to their own house, it's like the family members are left without support. So support should be ongoing. And it should be timely. You know, it's it's good to know somebody passed away. You don't wait till 10 years after to now figure it out or to say something. And, you know, it make it be timely. The support, that would be useful for persons to know that. And then the next task tells us to adjust to life without the disease. Now, hmm, wow, this is a big one. How do you adjust to life without the disease? And the truth is, how has this person's death impacted your everyday life? Um, perhaps this was a person who would take you to school and now you have to figure out how to get to school. Um, how has death impacted your feelings? Um, do you feel sad? Is it something you want to talk about? Do you feel comfortable talking to other persons? Um, spiritually, has this person's death change or challenge your views about God and his faithfulness. Um, people have been praying, you know, I prayed for them for so long and the Bible says I have to pray and the Lord will answer me and I prayed for my mothers or my aunts or whoever the family member is for the healing and God didn't answer and God not fair and he not good because he, my young, young son or my young, young child or my precious auntie and this faithful Christian, faithful follower of Christ. And we prayed so hard and we believed pastor with fasting and prayer and it didn't happen. And so sometimes it's it's that challenge that we have to process. Um, I normally try to say if we can't see God's hand, we trust his heart that he is still the God who is in charge. And he helps us with that. So adjusting to life without the disease is very challenging. Um, one of the cautions we have had and shared with persons who are, are married or widow or widowers is to refrain from getting involved in a serious relationship if you do not feel this is the best time for it. In fact, do not try to make major decisions or changes in your life at this time give yourself some time to ensure that yes this is really really what you want to do and then this last one talks about um how to evaluate if what step have you reached today is it something that you think you can i can do it i don't want to do it i have achieved it perhaps that's what you have done for yourself but it's like a little checklist for yourself to help you see how you're adjusting to life. And if you're not doing well, of course, you always ask for help. And the la this next slide talks about um, having a healthy self-care plan. So we had talked about it before, but I just want to put a visual here that we could see. So we have the mind, body, and spirit, or mind, body, and soul. We ensure that each facet of your life is is worked upon is help so you have time to relax to meditate exercise pray read your bible reflect take some time to relax without disturbance and you know figure that out for yourself and as you help yourself to do so then you'll be able to help other persons in that journey and then the last one the last task that we're going to do is to remember your loved one while moving forward in life um, as I started off by saying that those of us or some people who perhaps shared a different view, like Freud was saying, okay, when a person die, you no longer have relationships. So you sever ties and sever ties include do not try to remember the person and celebrate them and stuff like that. Um, of course, there are persons who, who think differently and believe differently. And so what they suggest, which I prefer myself, is to create a place for the loved one in your heart. 
and leave, leaves room for relationship with other persons or new relationships. And then to seek a balance between remembering your loved one and moving forward. And, and I have this, this um, visual. It's about honey being poured from a bottle and into these spoons and they cascade into the other. And what I remember about that is I'm thinking about the queen bee. When the bee dies, the one who creates the honey, she does not leave, she does not take the honey with her. She leaves it for us to enjoy. So think about your loved one, how you can remember them, how you can celebrate them. And some of us do that, and we perhaps didn't realize we have done that. Sometimes we, we name our children after parents who have passed, and sometimes we share possessions, persons who have passed. Now, of course, if you live in Mexico and um, their possessions to be shared, personal possessions are buried with the person when they depart. So we have no fighting about that. But we do in our culture and other places around the world, we share our names, we share possessions, and we sometimes have um, websites and we create uh, memori memorial in their honor. And sometimes we plant a tree and we different things and we name a street, we name a place, we name an airport. Um, you know, our way of celebrating that person. And this one talks about gratitude and grief. When we, we're in pain, it's difficult for us to find things to celebrate. And um, I'm thinking about if you, if you don't know when the last time somebody did a, a puzzle, like the one I'm suggesting, <laughs> and when that, miss it, that piece that is missing, oh my God, it's like the puzzle is incomplete and the pain and the sadness that is like, this one piece is missing. And that happens to us too when, a family member or a loved one is missing is like that missing piece the puzzle is incomplete but i want us to not just focus on that one puzzle that is incomplete think about the, all the other puzzles around you as representative of how that person impacted your life um perhaps the stories they tell they were a mentor to us they helped me get my first job or this was a person who was instrumental in me becoming a christian you know so there are many things that we could celebrate about the person we have lost so the other pieces of the puzzle is one way to focus and to cope and coping helps us to when we remember our loved ones it can help us to Focus on how the person made our life better. And sometimes just focusing on the positive and good things and grief can help us to cope with life, feeling hopeful of things that could happen. And practicing gratitude is an effective way to bring back joy to your life and one way to cope healthily with grief in our pain and sorrow. And um, there is comfort in our grief I think, um, yeah, so there's comfort in our grief and we get comfort from those around us. But of course, there's this verse I read sometime January 26th was, it came up on my feed. It says, this is of the Lord. It says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. And then the prayer goes on to say, dear Lord, you understand me. Thank you for holding me close to challenging times. You are my comforter. And that, that's, a, that's a good place to be, to know that when we go through these difficult times, while we may experience comfort from those around us, we know there is comfort that comes from God himself. And then we can grieve with hope, hope for a reunion of that relationship we have with with God, there is this, yeah, okay, hope, hope in grief and reunion. If you're a Christian, if you believe in the afterlife, you're going to be thinking, how can I be renewed or reunion with my loved one and reunion with God? So, like I said before, um, we know death is going to happen, but of course, nobody wants to die really right now. But there's some it says there is a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For Father, 
which over there to prepare us a dwelling place there. And he talks about the street by and by, where we shall meet on that beautiful shore and we'll be renewed with those, with God and our loved one. And then this last slide, there's a song that we are very familiar with. It is Well With My Soul. It's a song that we sing very often in funerals or churches. But I want us to learn the story behind it in case we didn't before. Um, it's about three or four minutes long, and then we'll hear what that is, and we will end there. So can you play that piece for me, please? The slide before that, or oh, if we didn't get it, oh, okay. I have a feeling what happens. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> Are you able to play it as a video? Oh, you say no. He says no. Okay. Well. Let, let me tell you the story behind it. That song, It Is Well With My Soul. Um, it's a song that was composed by a business owner. You could go do the research. But he had lost his, he and his family were traveling somewhere across the seas. I don't have the details because I was just hoping for it to be played with that information for me. But while he was traveling, his wife, he stayed behind to attend to some business matters. So his wife and four daughters went on this ship. And while they were traveling, the ship sank and his wife was saved. And she wrote back a, a note to say, saved alone. And of course, there was grief and pain. And prior to that, he had lost his young son the year before. And then sometime after, because he's a businessman, so he's traveling, his friend invited him to go on a trip. And he was traveling past where his daughters were, where, where his daughters died. And he composed the song. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sweet billows roll. Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So I could invite you to go Google it. Um, the story behind the song, it is well with my soul. And then the last slide will give us the last line of what I want to say. It is well with my soul. Is it well with yours? I thank you. And I hope that we will cope with grief better when we have the future in mind of our souls being well with God. Thank you. Wow. 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 Wow, Miss Laurier. This is excellent. 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 Thank you very much You're for welcome. sharing us, sharing with us, for teaching us for comforting us. There are persons this evening who just in this week um, have lost relatives. There are those who just last week buried relatives. So certainly this topic has resonated with some persons in a very real way. You know, some persons um, grieving is as 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 fresh as fresh as just today you know and um really mm -hmm. really want to thank you your your presentation has been so timely so clear you know just filled with so much information that everybody has been enriched as a result oh. of this presentation um i don't know uh, I had indicated to the folks that, well, if you have questions, please, you know, have the opportunity to type them in the chat. Um, we want to give an opportunity to call in if you are able to. Um, but what, what I'll do is ask my engineer if he could just find that song, It Is Well With My Soul, he could just play.
presentation to a close yes uh, sister Paul it says excellent presentation thank you very much for this presentation joy Redway said excellent she says excellent presentation God bless you Bertin says true excellent presentation Paula says awesome presentation Dolores says very informative presentation thank you for sharing Jacqueline Perry Howard says thanks so much sister very interesting presentation God bless you wow Sylvia Bartholomew says well presented my sister wow Danny she's clapping all the way yes mm -hmm. Rona says awesome presentation thank you for sharing wow 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 we are we are just so blessed and then you end with this question is it well with your soul you know oh my goodness yes before we start to shed a tear and before we start to wipe our eyes yeah we have to introspect and we have to ask ourselves is it well you know if people are going to be crying for us because we are gone is it well with our souls that we can go in peace mm -hmm. knowing that when we go we are going to go to be with the lord because you know the apostle paul says absent from the body yes is to be present with with the lord you know and um we want to make sure it is well with our souls we want to make sure we get right with god we have a personal relationship with jesus wonderful sister Lorraine, we're going to ask you to to offer a word of prayer for those who are grieving, um, even now as we speak, I know God has used your presentation to encourage a number of persons who are going through this period. They are on this journey as we speak. And you have shared so many Ooh. wonderful nuggets of truth that no doubt they are able now to cope much better. So we're going to ask you to pray yeah. yeah just before i pray let Sorry. me express my own condolences to you those of us those of you who are grieving that it's a difficult space to be in right now and i trust that god will encourage you and keep you in his loving arms and i'm sending my special hug and love for you as well 
Let's pray. Wonderful. Father, we thank you that you're good. You're kind, you're gracious, you're merciful. And as we pray for those who mourn eternal Lord and Father, we ask that you will comfort with your love and remind them that whatever they face, you are with them. We pray, O oh Lord, that each day you will give them renewed hope and a sense of certainty that nothing can destroy the good that you have given to them. And the time that they would have spent with their loved ones, those memories will be memories of hope, of prayer, of thanksgiving, of kindness. And that God may their memories be joyful and help them to find enriching moments in the days ahead, in the years ahead, and the friendships and the ways that you have encircled them with your love. May they experience your grace. And like the psalmist David will say, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. May you, O Lord, who is a God who faileth not, grant them your strength and that your strength will be their portion forever. We thank you that, God, you promise us that those who mourn shall be comforted. So tonight we ask that, Lord, you will send your comforting arms of love and kindness and grace and mercy on each person who experiences loss at this time. And we thank you that, Lord, we have the hope to know that someday there will be a reunion with them and with you. We pray as we ourselves process our own grief and life and the fact that we too will die someday. That may our souls, O oh Lord, be right with you so we can sing wholeheartedly and those who will sing after we are gone will say it is well, it is well with my soul and with their souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I, I just feel led to... To, to do something and I want us to just pause right where we are because there might be individuals on our platforms individuals who are not saved and somehow the Holy Spirit has spoken to their hearts and we want to join the Holy Spirit in his work of grace and mm. facilitate an individual or individuals surrendering to Christ this evening uh, to ensure that they end tonight. We end tonight's program with it being well with their souls. The Bible says, With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you're on a platform this evening and you're not saved, and you would like to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, will you pause now and... Repeat this prayer after me from the depths of your heart. The Bible says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Will you pray after me, Lord Jesus? I thank you. Thank you for loving me, for dying on the cross for my sins. I know I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. I invite you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Change my life. I receive you now as my Savior and my Lord. I commit myself completely to you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. I know it is now well with my soul. If you prayed a while ago with me, my engineer you know, has thrown up a link on the screen where you are, depending on the platform you're on. You can click that link and get in touch with us so we can follow up with you. Um, uh, Paula, Paula says, I love the acronyms. I screenshotted them, each of them, so I can have, have them for future reference. She says, we were seeing this at work the other day, how we should cope with death. She works in a cancer center in, 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 in New York. And so she's thanking you for those acronyms. Yes. And um, on behalf of 
all of us, I want to say thanks again to Sister Lorian Joseph, yes, for coming and for sharing with us excellent, excellent presentation. Sister Lorian, boy, you know, I noticed in your bio, it says that you, you, you specialize in career counseling, premarital, marital, family, which means when we have somebody with, 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 with such depth and wealth of knowledge, you know, we, we have to show our great appreciation by utilizing, utilizing, <laughs> utilizing your gifts and your skills so you can enrich our lives. People in different countries have been blessed by your presentation, different places, and we look forward to having you back in the future. Thank you once again. God bless you and your family. And may he continue to make you and your family a blessing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. It's my pleasure. We'll see you again. Perhaps in person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. I want to say thanks to my producer, Sister Bertine Thomas, and our engineer, Brother Matthew T. Special thanks to Sister Jody and Young, who recommended our guest. Our guest is her <laughs> sister. Thank you, Sister Jody. God bless you. God bless you all. You. We are just so grateful you're able to join us. Remember, tomorrow evening, we'll be back at 8 for our prayer meeting and Bible study. Yes, and you can join on any of the platforms you are on this evening. We look forward to spending time in God's presence and in God's word. We're looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You cannot afford to miss uh, Bible study as we learn more. We're going deeper. Yes. And going higher in Jesus. Have a great night with a great God.